everyone, and welcome to The Backline with Rob and Adam. My name is Rob Norman, author of the cool improv book, Improvising Now, A Practical Guide to Modern Improv. And my name is Adam Colley, alumnus of the Second City Main Stage. Um, Adam Colley, how are you, my friend? I mean, feeling feeling very fortunate, I think, at the moment. Um, just I think overwhelmed with a lot of uh, feelings for uh, what's going on in Ukraine, and um, it's a it's a pretty heavy time. Um, yeah, so uh, every day feels like we're getting new information, and we are um, um, seeing a lot of what at least what what Canada and the U.S. are doing uh, in terms of trying to help. And um, yeah, it's uh, it, it's a lot right now. It is a lot, you know, this, we just celebrated my daughter's one year birthday, mm. first birthday. And I think experiencing war as a father, it just hits different. Mm. And I guess this war hits different in a lot of different ways. Like be, because the president of Ukraine is a comedian, he's an improviser. You could literally watch Zelensky play the piano with his junk. Because you and I have spent so much time traveling through Europe, we've met so many incredible friends. You know, we have a lot of friends who are in Poland right now. Um, my friend Simon is currently in Poland, crossing the Ukrainian border every day to deliver gasoline to like four different cities. That's an incredible risk. Yeah. I also, um, my friend Goja, who's also in Poland, is very close with the folks who run this Ukrainian improv group. And one of those guys um, joined the territorial defense force like most people do. And so I've been kind of watching his videos on Facebook, just seeing what it's like. And I was kind of scrolling through his Facebook messages. And like maybe a month ago, he was talking about canceling his improv show. He said, I can't, we're not going to do the improv show because of what's going on with Russia. And, and <laughs> that's crazy to me. It's, it's crazy. I mean, I've canceled many improv shows in my time, so that's a familiar thing, but to do it because you're about to be invaded. Um, yeah, it, it, it just hits completely differently. Yeah. The, so. um, the bravery that we're witnessing, the, um, the collective um, push against this invasion has been inspiring and shocking. And, um, you know, we're on the other side of the world and you're just, your heart aches and you're like, I, I, I don't know what my mental state would be in that situation. I don't know how I would handle it. You, you hope that you would be as brave as uh, the Ukrainian people and, but you don't know. So um, we're um, all very impressed and uh, our heart aches. And we really hope this gets resolved. And um, yeah, we just kind of send our love to the Ukrainian people. Yeah, it's, you know, as, as improvisers, it's just very trippy to be like, like this podcast that we're about to do, we'll probably talk about the best way to hold an imaginary cup and then you see what's happening in the other side of the world and you're like oh well that's that's a whole different world it's a world that you and i thought we would never have to experience in our lifetime we read about it in history books but it will never happen again let's let's focus on holding the imaginary cups right now yeah that's what we're going to spend our life doing and you're like that's not true for everyone and it may not be true for us soon who knows who knows Okay, well, let's um, let's get to the art of making up things. For yeah, Shall I mean, we, Adam? look, this is all we can do, which is uh, do what we do, and hopefully, this is um, a positive thing for anyone listening. And uh, if this gives you some respite or some joy, lovely. That's mm -hmm. that's how we can offer a small morsel of hope. Absolutely, um, but this week. I want to chat a little bit about timing. Time what? Timing is timing. You nailed it. You gave me an example of bad timing, but oh. you could have also just done 
you didn't have to do a bit. You could have just responded normally. It would have also worked. <laughs> so this is, comes from our friend in the assembly in Mexico, Francisco. And Francisco wanted to know a little bit more about timing. Um, he had some specific questions that he was hoping to learn more about. But I thought maybe we could start with the, the, the basics of this. Timing. Timing, AC. Why is timing important to comedy? It feels like timing is is important to comedy, but it's also important to every interaction you have. Um, timing for me is is the rhythm, right? The, it's the rhythm of every moment where you can feel it. It's very hard to identify. Like it's not like teaching a sketch structure where like when this happens, this happens. Rhythm is something that you have to learn over time through making a million mistakes. Right? It's like saying the wrong thing at the wrong time in a situation. Rob, you're going through something, I make a joke. Well, that's not the rhythm of this moment. That's not what is needed at this time. And so mm. every scene, every interaction has a rhythm. And so comic timing is learning to ride that rhythm and feel when things are the appropriate time to say something or when things are off rhythm. For me, that's how it feels. Mm. I like what you've just said a lot when you're, you're talking about timing as a kind of musicality or rhythm and a rhythm is a pattern, right? It's a, it's a beat that you hear, you know, four, four time or whatever it is, three, four time. I'm just naming time signatures. Yeah. But, but we could also think about that pattern or that, that rhythm as an expectation, an expectation of what should happen next. Like you were talking about, talking about something, you know, oh, we're at a funeral. There's a lot of tension around here. We know how this interaction is supposed to go. There is a rhythm or an expectation of what's supposed to happen next. And so comedians not only are aware of what should happen, but also can use that pattern to disrupt expectation and create comedy. So I think you're 1 million percent correct that it is a rhythm of how things should go but also it is a mindfulness of how to disrupt this particular pattern. Is that fair? Yeah, I think, like I think about um, um, moments where it's like there's uh, that electricity in the air between two people and they maybe they're about to kiss. And it's like that, like, are we doing this? Are we not doing this? How do I... Uh, should I go for it? And then you go for it and the person pulls back and is like, what are you doing? This is not, I wasn't feeling the same thing as you. And that is the rhythm of that moment. You, you misjudged the rhythm of that moment. And I think when you want to disrupt something for comedy, um, it could be, be that you absolutely abandon this rhythm and create that surprise or it is um, continuing on with that rhythm with an unexpected um, behavior element mm -hmm. yeah so and that kind of ties into game with the scene what you're talking about like either we're going to accentuate a pattern that's already there or we're going to disrupt it and we're going to create something different um Actually, that's, that's also interesting just thinking about the, the two main ways that we might think about comedy, right? Is it, a, you know, a, you know the, the regular day and then something crazy happens? Uh, this is the inciting event. If this is true, then what else is true? Or is this more game-based where we're thinking about creating the same pattern and kind of um, exploring it more? Um, well, it's like the, the that... It's it's interesting. This is it this disruption or is it riding the rhythm? Because I think innately there are moments where it's like, oh, the 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 villain is dead. We we accomplished our goal, and then the music starts to fade, and then he comes back for one more, and you're like, right, that is that 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 is following that rhythm. And if you wait a little too long or if you do it too early, you miss your shot. Mm. So it's like, am I disrupting the rhythm or am I following the rhythm of this moment to maximize surprise or to maximize impact? 
am I following this rhythm with my gut of like tapping your feet to a beat? Mm. Or am I saying, I understand the rhythm you want, that this music should just slowly fade and the movie ends. But by having them, this villain come back one more time, am I disrupting the rhythm? I'm not sure. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think... But for me, you know, it, is, it is those... Oh, it's like when you think of we brought up funeral, it's like as a kid, kids are running around funerals. They have no idea what's going on. They don't have the experience of, oh, there's a rhythm to when people are mourning. There's a rhythm for how these situations happen. And as you grow and as you are in front of a live audience, whether that be your family at the dinner table or a theater packed full of people, you start to learn these rhythms and you can feel when that beat has either uh, is either swelling or that moment when you, you've missed it. And don't say it now because now it doesn't work. Save it, you know? Yeah. yeah, I think you're totally right. And I mean, like, I think maybe this might be one of those things. If we're talking about comedic timing, it's really hard to maybe quantify when it's going well. Like, we, we probably just say <laughs> that people are just funny if they have good timing and we can't really explain why the the moments for me where timing becomes very clear is when you see someone with bad timing and i'm just wondering mm. ac i'm sure you've seen someone with bad timing um what does that look like well i mean i'm sure everyone can relate to this but growing up listening to drum and bass oh my god um <laughs> my uh, <laughs> everyone can relate the to listening to drum whole... and bass as everyone can relate to you grow up in pickering in a small house uh, your parents are divorced you're listening to drum and bass non-stop you're part of the smith improv team and you can all relate to this of course you get it of course right um but uh drum and bass a lot of it is beat matching mm. right so you've got one track and then you want to mix in the other track uh making it feel like both tracks are they merge and then one fades while the other swells bad timing is just saying i like this second music tune there's one playing i like this other one i'm going to throw this record anytime i like just because i like the idea of it mm. well that's going to sound horrible so bad timing is basically forcing a moment that does not um that does not work and saying it's like when you see this is this kills me and I I've done it and I try not to you and I are in a scene and we kind of have a moment where we speak at the same time and I don't get my joke out and then I say like yeah but you and then as soon as you stop talking I go yeah but you and I force that moment that was going to work but instead of saying, ooh, we talked at the same time, that moment is gone, I have to look for another one, I say, I'm just going to repeat what I was going to say anyway. I'm not even listening to Rob. Yeah. And you force that moment in. So I think that's what it is, is um, just inappropriate forcing of something that does not belong. That's what it feels like for bad timing. Yeah, or like, it's unfortunate because there are some people who you see in an improv class and for whatever reason, just the, the way that they speak is it creates problems for them to get laughs. For, for example, there are some people who are, um, I want to say close talkers, but basically they start talking while you're still talking and, and there's no opportunity <laughs> for laughs. So they swallow both your laugh and their laugh. That would be an example of having bad timing to not give the proper space when, when you're in a funny scene. Um, we need to give space for the audience to laugh. We need to have those punctuations. Um, you know, it, it's also very possible that maybe someone, um, the, the way that they speak is slower. So p the audience is able to figure out their punchline before they get to it. Stuff like that. There's like these little things that are very hard to quantify, but you can hand someone a script from the second city main stage, the archives, and ask them to perform it. And you can have two groups perform the exact same scene. And they could also be same level of experience, of actorly ability, but for whatever reason, one group crushes and the other group does nothing with it. And, and it's really hard to point to that first group to be like, 
Well, what the second group did that you didn't do is the way you experience the world and your pacing within it. Like, that's a hard thing to learn. Do you think there's a way to get better at timing? Have you noticed that your timing has improved over the course of your career? I I do, and I think... I think it is just trial and error, unfortunately, right? You, there are, <laughs> I love bits. I love jokes. And so there are so many moments where I'm in a group of people and I'm like, here it comes. I can, I'm, I'm riding this wave. And then the moment comes and I'm about to say something and something disrupts the moment. Mm -hmm. Someone drops a cup or whatever. It doesn't matter. But learning, okay, hold back. Mm -hmm. Don't do it yet wait for the, ne the next wave, right? Mm -hmm. It's like um, it's like when you see people trying to get into double dutch, right? And they're doing that, that back and forth and they're trying to get in, what is my timing mm -hmm. here? Mm -hmm. And it could be that things are half a second off, mm -hmm. that your, your left foot is not grounded and you're just reading the room, mm -hmm. right? You are, you're paying attention. So the idea of, I mean, I hear so much of this, my parents were divorced, so I never had it but like sitting around the dinner table and being like, that's where they learned comedic timing, mm. being in front of their family. And I think for us, we've been very lucky to just be in front of audiences for so long that you start to really be attuned to what is the vibe of this audience? How are we, um, how can I adjust the comedic timing based on this moment? There's, there's a, an example that, that I'll never forget it was a little different because it was um, sketch, but uh, I was doing a, a main stage show called Something Wicked Awesome This Way Comes. There was a, and for I'm sure we've talked about this a million times, but the idea of a Second City show is you um, improvise your scene based off of a premise. A director sees that in front of a crowd. They give you notes. Either they say, nah, let's not do that, or let's try it again. Let's try it again. And then you do it like, 45 times before it gets into the show sometimes scenes get better and sometimes scenes get worse mm. and it is one of the worst feelings in the world because you're doing this off of improv you have no idea why a moment worked sometimes it could be your facial expression could be something that happened in the background and i was doing a scene called donkey kong and this was a scene about it doesn't really matter, but basically <laughs> a lot of the, the set kind of looked like old school Donkey Kong with ladders and um, staircases and stuff. Anyway, uh, the scene transformed from being at a club where I was trying to like um, uh, dance with my girlfriend and this big hulking man comes and kind of takes my girlfriend away and it slowly transitions into oh, that's Donkey Kong, I'm Mario, I have to save the princess, like, the video game. Anyway, it started off wonderfully. Audiences were killing themselves. And then it started to get worse. And I could not figure it out. It was killing me. Luckily, at Second City, we record every set. So we've got piles and piles of DVDs. I don't know how they do it now, probably some digital file. But I, I was like, I have to figure this out. So I started to go back and watch every single version of it. Whoa. And it turned out it was timing. And the timing was a music cue. The transition from me going into this video game world happened before the music cue that started to go into like that Nintendo synth music. Mm. And originally the music came first. And then slowly our timing was off between me and our musical director. And as soon as I found that and I talked to the music director and we fixed it, it was, it was great ever since. But that small timing moment of giving the audience a second to clue in like, oh, the world has changed. The music has dramatically shifted. Oh, his physicality has shifted. I'm now on board. That was something where it's like, that wasn't innate ability. That was... I need to research why this timing failed and how to get it back. That's really interesting. I, I mean, I, I love a lot of what you just said there. The double dutch is such a great way to phrase that. The two skipping ropes you're trying to 
they're going the opposing ways mm-hmm. and they're trying to jump in there. It's exactly what it feels like being on stage, especially if you're trying to figure out, I want to walk in or I want to tag in. You can see that kind of with new improvisers, there's a hesitancy because they, they, they're not sure what the, the right time is. For you and I, I, I don't think, I don't remember the last time I've been on stage where I wasn't sure what time I should enter. There's been times where I've been like, maybe I should <laughs> have entered or maybe I shouldn't do this joke. Let's figure it out if it works. But the timing isn't really a problem for me. But I could definitely see that for, for new improvisers, why it would be a challenge. I'm also thinking a lot about this process that you're describing is something that most improvisers will never get to experience. And probably I would say the number one reason why I think if you're an improviser, doing some stand up would help you because that is mm. exactly what you're talking about. You have a bit, you're trying to polish it. You're doing it over and over and over again to see what the perfect version of your timing should be for this particular joke. And in that process, I think it would tell you a lot about when you are funniest or what is the cadence that can sell a joke. Um, also, I mean, maybe, maybe we could talk a little bit about tension and release here. How does, how does that, mm-hmm. you talk about these waves here of trying to find the right spot. Can you tell me a little bit about how tension and release works with those waves? Well, I mean, these, this is why comedic timing is, is it, it feels like we could just take out comedic and it's just timing. Um, the, the goal that you are trying to achieve that determines whether it's comedic or dramatic or, um, musically sound like whatever it is, but building up tension, just like the, the horror movie, right? We, the villain has been defeated. And so you have a release of tension and then nothing is happening for a second and you start to build up that tension again and then the villain comes back and that reaction is usually result in a scream or a laugh and that is a majority of the comedy that we are doing an unexpected uh turn from a character an unexpected response an inappropriate reaction all of these things uh help build and then release tension um and this is kind of why we have scenes where um you know if if the content is wacky we need something to ground it and if the characters are wacky we kind of want the content to be grounded because we need something to actually build up tension so that we can release it if we've got two wacky characters talking about a wacky situation, you're kind of relying on your wit and your wordplay, maybe your physicality. But when we have nothing that can build up that tension, it's like if you've ever played a video game I have. and you're playing with like a street fighter kind of game I have. and you're, uh, you use your special power and it depletes and then you need to build it back up so that you can release it again. It's not how street fighter works. You know, like in Pickering. <laughs> What's that? It's not how Street Fighter works at all. Not Street Fighter, but like X-Men? Capcom versus Marvel. X-Men or something? Yeah, okay, sure. Great. No, I think I think that's awesome, Macy. Um, yeah, y- you know what I, I was thinking about while you were talking? I was thinking about... Um, oh, I thought you were going to think about my what I was saying and how valuable that was. I got it. I got it right away. I understood what you're saying. Um, <laughs> I've been watching this show on Amazon Prime called um, Laugh Out. Last One Laughing is what it's called. LOL, Canada. Okay. Last one laughing. And basically they take these Canadian comedians and they put them in a room and you can't laugh. It's an improv game. It's it's literally a six hour improv game. And our buddy Colin Mockery's in there. Tom Green's in there. Dave Foley from Kids in the Hall's in there. And it's actually really interesting watching all of these funny people try to be funny with people who have excellent comedic defenses against a lot of easy jokes and watching people kind of lose their minds throughout this process. And, and really they keep testing the waters to try and figure out what's going to get you, but it's hard. Like imagine making Tom green laugh. How would you, 
do that? What would what would you be your plan of attack? And I think time cut open a milk bag and spray it all over the place. No, he'd be like, "That's what I do." <laughs> You'd have to like oh. do something else. I don't know what it would be. Like, yeah, tell a regular joke. I don't know. But Tom Green's actually really interesting because you know his he's really interested in timing, and he's really interested. Like a lot of people are going for surprise jokes. So I'm saying something to you in the middle of it. I twist it. But for some reason, that mm-hmm. doesn't seem to be doing very well in the room. Um, but Tom Green is just repeating the same phrase over and over and over again <laughs> in a weird way, putting weird breaths in the middle of his sentence. Um, someone who I love, who I think is so talented, is, is um, Mae Martin. Um, they do this show called Feels mm-hmm. Good, and it's funny and it's very sweet. Um, and watching May deal with Tom Green, mind blowing, M- mind blowing to see someone try to resist someone who is who they just don't know how to deal with it. It's like May's brain is like dysfunctioning around Tom Green repeating the same thing over <laughs> and over and over again. And if you write down what Tom Green has actually said, there is nothing funny about it. There's nothing funny about the premise. There's nothing funny about the content of what he's saying. It's quite benign. He's talking about cheese sandwiches. There's nothing funny there. The only thing that could be funny is um, maybe a lack of effort in trying to get you laugh, like such such a careless joke, not trying to have a punchline, uh, and then playing with timing. Those are the only two things I could see that would possibly be funny. So looking towards these certain people where you're like, why is Tom Green famous? I guess his superpower is timing. Well, there's like, there's a state of being that I think just humans have of, I'm looking out for myself. I'm trying to protect myself. And so when you're watching someone perform, you kind of have this empathy of like you're doing something like you're telling a joke wow this is intense if i was doing that that would be very scary and then to watch like yeah cheese uh cheese sandwiches and you're like that's what you went with huh it's pretty brave you're, you're not going to do that again are you oh uh, yeah cheese sandwiches huh well it's it's kind of funny i was nervous for you but you just did it again and you feel confident in it you're not going to do that again, are you? And you, you're like, get nervous for them. And then when they do it again, you're like, uh, I, my reaction is laughter. Like I've released the tension because you seem okay with this. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's such a, an odd feeling because it's, as you said, like if you wrote it down, you'd be like, well, this is brutal. But for someone to, buck that trend and just say i know this is not funny and i'm gonna keep doing it it's again you're watching a daredevil you're like there's a way around niagara falls you don't have to walk across it but you're gonna walk across it well the tightrope that seems like a bad idea well i gotta see this right like you're constantly saying you're improvising you just got hit with this incredibly dramatic line of dialogue you're in the audience being like, oh my God, H- how are you going to respond? And when the response gets a laugh, it's usually because you're like, I can't believe they said that. That surprised me because I was under the impression that you were going to look after yourself and you didn't. You made the problem worse. It's interesting because, you know, I have taught, we both have taught at, I think, every theater in Toronto. We know the curriculum of most theaters in Toronto. And I can't think of a single exercise used to teach comedic timing. Uh, Give and take focus Mm. is something that we teach a lot, but that's more about kind of creating a theatrical sense of dialogue where you're not talking over each other, you're feeling for your time to speak. But when we talk about actually focusing on an activity that strengthens comedic uh, comedic timing, I can't think of a single thing to work that muscle. The only thing I could think of is putting you on stage in front of people. Yeah, because it, it, 
again, it's it's not like a sketch structure or something binary where you can say, do this, wait three beats, then do that. Because every individual is going to be different, right? And, and I think you're when you brought up stand-up earlier, it's a great example. The best stand-ups have a character. They're playing a persona, whether that be something completely wacky or just a heightened version of themselves. Every individual's timing is going to be different based on their character and based on the audience that they attract, right? It's like David Sedaris versus like Anthony Jeselnik. It's like their timing is going to be very different. Mm -hmm. And I think learning, especially as an improviser, because you may have to play a David Sedaris type or an Anthony Jeselnik type, you have to learn that every character, every moment is going to have unique timing. And basically, you just get better at reading cards. You're a gambler, and you're just counting cards. You're just like, I think this is going to give me the best chance here, and sometimes you fail. But the more you're on stage as a different group of characters, the better you are at beating the house. And Yeah, you know, you and I both dipped our toes into stand-up we were like this is something that we should figure out how to do and and for me i personally found it very very hard it's probably one of the most challenging things i've ever done in comedy and my main issue ac was i was never sure what voice i should use on stage does that make sense i think for us Mm -hmm. as improvisers you collect a lot of different characters you can probably play a character who is misanthropic or you could take a character who is childlike and gleeful they have their own rhythms and we've probably gotten laughs playing both styles of characters so when someone says write for yourself put it in your own voice and step on stage and do a bit i find that really hard the best trick that I found was I picked a character before I went on stage and didn't tell the audience. And that's who I told them Rob Norman was that night. But I didn't like, I hated that. Cause I was like, this actually isn't me at all. It's not even close to me. It, this it's, it's the worst of both worlds where I'm like, well, I'm playing a character, so I'm not myself. Uh, but also I'm telling you it's me. I'm like, mm, I don't like that. I didn't like that feeling at all. Yeah, I'm, I mean, imagine, I'm just thinking about this now, but imagine the idea of going to see your favorite stand-up and them just being like, I don't know, having a bit of an off day. I'm just going to talk to you guys just about what's going on. You'd be like, I need you to be the thing that you always are because I, I understand you, right? Um, I think that's why everyone uh, hated The Last Jedi. I'm just like, I need Luke to be Luke. I don't understand this new character. I actually loved it. Anyway, um, but th- that idea of I'm honing my voice. I've got my timing down perfectly for my audience, for my character. Great. But then socially or improvisationally, sketch-wise you're saying I need to adjust and make myself um, an eight-year-old, a turtle, a, an aggressive bear, all of these characters. And I need to figure out their timing very quickly. That is a unique challenge for improvisers, but also um, part of the reason why improv is so incredible and improvisers are so incredible at comedic timing is because they can sense the moment of the, that they are in the audience the theater the scene partner they have and make adjustments on the fly and that's why i love it and it feels like improvisers and athletes are so similar you're playing a different team every night and you're like well what's their offense well how do i quickly make adjustments to make my timing defeat their defense like it's it's a it's a bonkers idea but it is something that you just learn by doing. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of exercises now, and they all feel like um, 
basically manufacturing stage time. I mean, how do I put you in front of the class and walk you through things and just have the audience be like, you missed it. <laughs> I mean, you know, there is, there's those kinds of, uh, short form games where you improvise a stand up joke. So for example, like 101 or sex with me is like, like those might be examples where you are playing with timing. Um, but again, that's a short form game and the presets are so clear. It's, there's only really three or four different voices you could take on within those, those structures, but that helps with timing a little bit. You can talk a little bit about some comedic elements there, but you're right. Other than that, it's, it's really hard to learn that kind of specific timing. I think that's awesome talking about the timing within a scene, but maybe it's easier for you and I to chat a little bit about kind of some macro structures and where they should be placed within a show. And, and these are some of Francisco's questions. So um, we've talked a lot about editing before, but just timing, when you feel that edit AC, when is it that time to edit? Well, I think this is where you have a bit more control because um, there are things that are less moment to moment and more taking care of the show in itself. So things you could think about when worrying about timing in your editing is variety. How long is each scene? Is each scene three and a half minutes and then you edit three and a half edit? Well, that's kind of training the audience to um, get numb to scene initiations and scene endings. So just making sure that you're you're uh, keeping a sense of variety and play and, and um, whimsy in the show with short scenes, long scenes, uh, tag outs, anything to keep the variety going. So if you're thinking, this scene could go on another three minutes because it's killing, but that would take it to the same time as all of our other scenes, you know what? I'm going to step out of this rhythm and end it early for the benefit of the show. And so that's kind of that disruption that you were talking about earlier, where this is less about I'm following my gut and more of I'm looking as an outsider on the show as a whole and going to make adjustments to make the show better. Um, that That isn't necessarily maybe the best comedic moment, but it will pay off in the long run. Yeah, I also think if you're if you're struggling to find the time when to edit, you know, scenes are either on their way to becoming better or they're about to become worse. There's like a point where you can feel <laughs> like this is the end of the scene. And if you do it too soon, you're interrupting fun and the audience feels weird about it. It feels like an unrealized potential of the scene and it doesn't feel good to the audience. If you edit after the potential has been realized, that's that's a big downer. It feels like you've you've let them down. So there is this like little point between those two moments that's just perfect. And how can I tell you when that is? I can't, because every scene is different. Every scene has its own language. Every scene has its own pace. Some scenes are designed to be thirty seconds. Some scenes are designed to live for. 45 minutes or whatever it's it's you have to be in that space and figure it out for new students i would say i like to err on the side of editing too soon as opposed to editing too late because once you edit too late it becomes harder and harder and harder to edit because you're going to get less and less laughs so at least editing early you can edit on a laugh point and make your life a little bit easier and also, if you edit early, you're giving that scene a chance to return mm -hmm. if needed. If you have a scene wear out its welcome, no one wants to see those characters return. 